What can be said about the original King Kong movie that hasn't already been said at this point? As of the time I'm writing this, the film is over 90 years old, and countless reviews, documentaries, and articles have been written about it throughout the years since its release in 1933. That right there just goes to show you how much love this movie receives, even after all this time. It makes no difference how antiquated the effects appear, or how simplistic the plot is. King Kong is a timeless classic that will continue to captivate audiences for many generations to come. Simply because, it's a fantastic film, and of course one of the great granddaddies of special effects cinema. RKO had taken a huge risk with this picture. They desperately needed a box office hit to keep their lights on if they were going to be in business for the long run. And in the end, King Kong's gamble paid off. Cinemas showing the film were often packed. There were lines extending around the block on opening day at theaters. For the first four days of its run, the movie sold out for every one of the ten shows that were planned a day in advance. Reviews were positive, and word spread about the enormous gorilla that stood atop the newly constructed Empire State Building. And this was 1933, at the heart of the Great Depression. People were unhappy and despondent. They needed a thrilling adventure. They needed escapism and King Kong provided just that. Since then, the movie has gained widespread recognition that continues to this very day, spawning a legacy for the character of Kong throughout the decades to come. Like having a child he probably never knew about, fighting a robot version of himself, being granted honorary citizenship in the key to New York, receiving a heart transplant, fist bumping the Iron Giant while watching Looney Tunes play basketball, and running in unison with Godzilla to create memes and do other wacky stuff. We'll talk about all that when we get to it. For now, we're going over the original 1933 classic and see what makes it just that. So what is the plot to the original King Kong? Well, the movie's about a big time movie producer named Carl Denham who simply wants to find a woman for his next picture. To appease viewers and critics who believe his films would be more fascinating if romance was included. Boy, have we come very far on that statement. He eventually does find a woman for his film named Andero, who, after enjoying a delicious dinner from Denim, graciously accepts the part of... of a uh, female lead in unknown picture. Denim and Anne then set sail aboard the SS Venture to a strange, unknown island that Denim knows about thanks to a map he obtained. When they arrive on the island, they come across a massive gorilla named Kong and a whole slew of prehistoric creatures. Denim and the crew then capture Kong and bring him to civilization in hopes of gaining fame and wealth, until Kong escapes and causes chaos in New York City. Now, apart from the opening act, doesn't some of this sound a little familiar? I mean, I realize we're very early in this series, but wasn't this whole setup identical to the Lost World? I mean, consider it. Characters travel to an unknown part of the world where they encounter prehistoric animals, and the man who obtained the info about this location manages to bring one of those creatures back to a major city to gain fame and or fortune, only to have it blow up in his face when he realizes his main attraction has escaped and is running amok downtown. Hell, there's even little monkeys that tag along in both stories. RKO must have realized the similarities were clear, because prior to shooting King Kong, they had purchased the rights to the Conan Doyle novel, as well as the rights to the 1925 film from Warner Brothers, to avoid any plagiarism allegations. But that is interesting. Given that the techniques and concepts in both films are nearly identical, how come King Kong is frequently seen as a groundbreaking phenomenon, loved by many, while the Lost World is hardly brought up at all, despite it coming before Kong? Well, it helps that Kong's full movie has at least remained intact for all these years, well, until the Hays Code came into effect shortly after and trimmed it down, until later on when the footage was put back in, and, well, that's off topic. Anyway, I believe the explanation is simply in its execution. The Lost World story only goes so far when it gets to the dinosaurs, and after that, the narrative essentially comes to a screeching halt so it can show them off to audiences. So much so, that many story beats from the novel are excluded in favor of dino action. And even though the production firm realized the money signs a little later, they still clearly wanted a profit from the breakthrough visual effects at the time. And it must have worked, because according to stories, many people who saw this film around the time 
thought this was footage of real dinosaurs. They believed it. Who cares about a story? Look at the dinosaurs, everyone! King Kong, on the other hand, was constructed on a foundation of love from its creator, Marion Cooper, who intended to create a riveting non-stop adventure story and fought hard to get his film made the way he wanted it, not allowing many to tamper with his vision. As a result, the film's structure is simply more fascinating to watch, with likable characters, good pacing, and an overall better put together thriller story. The soundtrack of King Kong is another enhancement over The Lost World. While that movie came close to the talky sound era, the film itself is a voiceless picture. And as a result, 80% of the population refuses to watch it simply because. No seriously, I see this all the time where people refuse to watch these types of movies because their way of communicating is text boxes on screen. And sadly, because they are in black and white. Ugh. Nevertheless, King Kong was fortunate to be released at a time when advances in sound technology allowed the film to sound almost like a contemporary production. King Kong even has the honor of being the first motion picture with an entirely original soundtrack written for a film. Music had already been around in movies, but Kong's score was unlike anything at the time. And the music is so good. I mean, I can't even imagine this movie without that epic Max Steiner score. It truly enhances on what is already a great adventure film. However, at one point in the movie's development, that amazing score was never going to be. President of RKO Pictures, B.B. Kane, was unwilling to add to the already massive budget of the picture as he continued to think that the movie had little chance at the box office. Therefore, he didn't want to spend any more money on original music. Rather, he told Steiner to just repurpose music that had already been recorded for other movies. On the contrary, Cooper believed that a noteworthy original soundtrack was necessary for his film, and he made the decision to give King Kong an original soundtrack by spending an additional $50,000 of his own money. Now that is dedication. King Kong's composer Max Steiner would help establish the parameters for how movies could feel even more epic than what they could only depict. Here, Steiner does an amazing job with the score, and in a way, he makes the music feel like it's part of the characters, employing a technique known as Mickey Mousing. This was a method for accurately matching music to the on-screen action, which was common in most animated productions at the time, like in Mickey Mouse shorts, hence the name. This is particularly apparent on the island segments. Take note to anyone walking or running, and pay attention to how the music suddenly stops and starts, with the tempo often matching whatever mood the situation calls for. It might irritate some people, but I think it makes the movie more charming than it already is. Oh, and just to be clear on something, I am not comparing King Kong to the Conan Doyle novel The Lost World, but instead to the 1925 film adaptation. I still think Kong's a better story overall, and that's just my opinion. Speaking of novels, I guess I should also talk about this film's novel of the same name. It might surprise some of you to learn that the novelization of King Kong was published some time before the movie's release. That being said, the film's plot is entirely original and isn't based on any kind of literature. The novelization was created purely as a straightforward marketing ploy for the film. Edgar Wallace, the original screenwriter for the picture, was initially tasked with both writing the screenplay and creating the novel to help promote the movie. Unfortunately, Wallace died of pneumonia before he could even finish the script, let alone start writing a book. Given Wallace's status as a great mystery writer, it's understandable why Cooper would want him to pen the story of King Kong to help attract some more exposure towards it. As replacement screenwriters were being brought in for the movie, Cooper looked towards a friend of his to pen the novel, Delos Lovelace, who had used the first draft of the Ruth Rose screenplay as the basis for the story. And the book was published on December 27, 1932. Now this is interesting because the novel's narrative was derived from the initial Ruth Rose screenplay. However, even though the screenplay was used to create the movie, many of its elements were eventually removed from the final cut due to issues with the film's pace and budget. With Cooper even going back to reshoot certain scenes to help get the story flowing better. Because so much changed between the original Ruth Rose screenplay and the final cut of the film, many aspects missing from the picture still exist in the book. 
but for whatever reason, Loveless added his own embellishments to the plot that weren't in the screenplay, likely just to better structure his version of the tale. However, there are some weird alterations to the Loveless version. For example, the ship the crew travel on is called the Venture, but in the novel it's called the Wanderer. And the character known as Charlie is renamed Lumpy for some reason? Because... well, because who cares about this guy? In relation to characters, does the cast of Kong surpass those of the Lost World in any way? I mean, that's a stupid question. The characters in Kong are undoubtedly superior than those in the Lost World. However, there are some things to discuss with them. Denim, Darrow, and Driscoll, the three main leads, are all likable enough, though to be honest, I only truly enjoy watching one of these three, and it should come to no surprise that it's Carl Denham. Denham, like Professor Challenger in The Lost World, is a wild card in this picture. I admire his charming zeal and determination to achieve his goals. He always has an optimistic tone, and is a delight to watch in almost every scene he's in. Denham's character was modeled after Cooper himself, and there is a lot to compare between the two. From there being both natural drama filmmakers who travel to exotic locations to shoot their films, even to the minor quip about Denim needing a female to win over audiences, since reviewers thought his movies would be better with romance, is an inside joke because that's exactly what people were criticizing Cooper's films for. It is without a doubt the reason why the romance subplot was incorporated into the narrative. In fact, given how incredibly fabricated Anne and Jack's romance is, I wouldn't dispute it if it was. We barely see enough moments with them to really care much. A little backstory for each character is included in the book, but the love subplot is rushed even further in that when Jack declares his love for Anne before they even reach the island. Their chemistry is non-existent, and the only reason they seem to love each other is that they are attracted to one another, a fact that the movie doesn't do a good job of conveying, besides the broadest of strokes. Which brings us to our leading lady herself, Anne Darrow, played by Fay Ray. It's understandable why, whenever this film is discussed, two things generally come up, Kong and Fay Ray. They are, after all, frequently paired together in almost everything related to the movie, including toys, books, and even the original promotional material. In a way, it's almost as if she is part of the original King Kong, and I'll have more to discuss on that later. Now, nothing against Fay Ray, she does a fine job as Anne, and King Kong is easily her most well-known film credit. In fact, if you missed it in my previous video, I stated that Fay Ray wore a blonde wig for the part, as she was naturally brunette. And it's hilarious when you try to search Fay Ray on Google Images, because some of the first pictures that come up are of her wearing the blonde wig from King Kong. It just goes to show you how tremendous that one role was for her, despite being not much more than a pretty face for the audience. Anne in this film isn't really a character, she's more of a plot device that sets everything in motion. Carl Denham has a map that leads to an undiscovered island, but he can't go yet because he needs a lady for his film, so Anne comes along. We now get to the island and discover that the native people perform rituals to their god Kong. The natives want Anne for the ritual. They abduct her, and Kong takes her away. The crew must save her, and they... um... Jack does. They bring King Kong to New York, he goes crazy and escapes, then kidnaps Anne, who needs to be rescued... again. The story isn't so much about Anne or the rest of the cast. They are of course components of the movie, but nothing really changes with them from start to finish. When we meet Anne, we discover that she has no family, save for an uncle that we never meet, and is struggling day-to-day -day life on the streets of Manhattan. When we wave goodbye to her at the end of the movie, nothing really changes with her character, except that she now has a fiancé in Jack, and it's not just her. The entire ensemble of King Kong does not go through any significant character arcs, save for Jack's sexist behavior in the beginning when he meets Anne, but the plot never delves too far into it, and it is virtually over before you know it. And before I see it in the comments, yes, I know about Denim's change in the sequel, but that's not Denim in this particular story. He does not grieve over anything that transpired throughout this whole adventure, where many people lost their lives, including his main attraction. For all we know, he just goes off and continues producing more films. Again, I know we find that out in the next movie, but we don't know that here. 
Now I understand it sounds like I'm criticizing the characters in this film, but I'd like to reverse that and say the following. Even if there is little character development with any of these individuals, I still like a majority of the players here. I do not believe characters must have these incredible character arcs in order to be likable. Sure, it could help define their function in the story and give them a personal objective, but even if we only know the basic fundamentals about them, they still can be entertaining to watch. I wouldn't say I like them so much that I'd be heartbroken if Kong squashed one of them, but I do enjoy their company well enough. What little personalities we see are perfect for this type of adventure story. And that's exactly what this movie is, an adventurous tale about a giant beast who cares for a tiny beauty. Cooper's films scarcely focus on characterization. Their plot is more centered on adventure, exploring intriguing new regions with so much excitement that you won't find in other films at the time. King Kong is all about the thrill. Once we get to Kong's Island, the story never stops introducing us to new and exhilarating elements. In relation to Kong's Island, you might find it interesting to learn that it goes unnamed. Yes, this island full of intriguing stuff goes without a name here. Now I'm sure most of you are aware that Kong's Island is often referred to as Skull Island, a name so powerful and appealing that it's frequently utilized in the titles of several Kong media. And yet, it's never called anything in this first movie, and that makes logical sense. This is supposed to be an unexplored island that no one knows about, therefore it is unlikely to have a name. The novel does, however, name it Skull Mountain Island, owing to the mountain's semblance to a skull. It's even indicated on the map in the film. So where did the name Skull Island originate from? To get that answer, we just have to look at the screenplays. While writing the first draft of the story, Edgar Wallace referred to the island as Vapor Island. When James Krillman took over as the replacement writer, the name was altered to Skull Island at some point. So there you have it. However, when Ruth Rose took over as the screenwriter, her screenplay never once mentions the name Skull Island. And this is the screenplay that's used in the final cut, which is also why the Loveless novel never explicitly names it as such. So while the name Skull Island did at one point appear in the screenplay, it was subsequently altered to never be referred to by name. But the name had to have reached the public somehow, so when did it? The first time the name is spoken of, at least in televised media, comes from the 1960s Rankin Bass cartoon series, The King Kong Show. In a few episodes, the characters refer to Kong's Island as Skull Island. Granted, the island is also known as Mondo Island about half the time, but that's besides the point. I'd like to get back to Skull Island before dark. But wait, there's more. Aside from actually hearing the name spoken aloud, the name did not make its public debut in the cartoon. That honor goes to a British newspaper of all places, known as the Daily Herald, which featured a written serialized version of King Kong drafted by Kingsley Long. And in it, the story does refer to the island as Skull Island, making this the first time the island's name gets mentioned in any type of King Kong media. In terms of the island itself, I must admit that this is by far my favorite depiction of it. I adore how stunning the island looks here. The Skull Mountain alone would have been enough to give it a nice visual flair, but it also has a massive wall at the base of the peninsula that lends even deeper mystery to a place that already has an eerie-like appearance. On subsequent viewings, you can notice additional details that you may not have noticed previously. For instance, when Jack and Anne are attempting to flee Kong by descending with a vine, I had never noticed the ship in the village in the background here, seeing how far the three have gone to get to where they are now. It is a small detail that never draws attention to itself, and I just love it. The landscape also has a wonderful mystique to it, with features like strangely shaped trees, hazy lake areas, and stunning looking rainforests that exude a mysterious aura, as if we've truly entered a fantasy world. Later versions of the island have their own unique visual landmarks, although their terrains are mostly uninteresting wastelands or generic forests, having very little distinction from any other jungle setting. Willis O'Brien, the project's chief technician, came up with the concept to model the jungles of Skull Island after the work of French artist Gustave Doré, an illustrator that created a lot of intricate unique artwork on lithographs, frequently producing extremely ominous black and white compositions. Thanks to Doré's influences, Skull Island has a surreal feel to it. In fact, the black and white image of this movie greatly helps with that aspect, emphasizing the important details and obscuring the ones that don't. 
often forming frames with the dark jungle surroundings. The style itself just makes Skull Island look like a work of art. It's a detail that would have been utterly lost if this picture had been in color. And there's no better way to demonstrate my argument than to watch the film in that way, as there is an official colorized version of the movie. To put it mildly, the outcome is... messy. The blending effects just don't translate well here, while the black and white image did a pretty good job concealing such effects. The color version for some reason has these extremely saturated hues in most of the environment, totally losing the dreamlike nature of Doré's influences on the picture. If you're going to watch this movie, watch it in black and white, but if you must, the color option is out there. Anyway, let's quickly go over how these wonderful sets were done. Similar to The Lost World, the jungle environments were constructed on tabletop setups, with the bases constructed on 2 inch pine. The table surface was about 3 fourths to an inch thick and pierced with a grid of 18 inch holes to fit the pegs in the model's feet. When the pegs were fastened with wires underneath, the models gained the stability required for the animation. Steel rods were connected to the model's sides as necessary to keep it steady while being animated. Glass paintings would also be reused from the Lost World. The artworks, which were measured 8 to 12 feet in diameter, were created in opaque gray tones on iridescence free plate glass. Occasionally a scene would require up to three sheets of glass. Normally the distance between the animation tables and the glass paintings was 18 to 20 inches, leaving less space for the animators to manipulate the figures. Now that we're talking about those dinosaur figurines, how about we discuss them? After all, this movie does have a good deal of action with the dinosaurs, and just like in The Lost World, once we get introduced to them, we just keep seeing them. However, it's not utterly redundant here as it was in The Lost World. Aside from a few moments with the Brontosaurus, almost none of the dinosaur action added anything to the story. Nothing would change if you skipped over a majority of it. King Kong's prehistoric giants add to the story in a far more meaningful way, with nearly every scene involving them serving a purpose. When the group travels through the island to save Anne from Kong, they come across a stegosaur. Denim uses a gas bomb to knock it out, to show us that these bombs will work against gigantic beasts, allowing them a chance to save Anne from Kong and survive their journey through the island. They run into the brontosaurus and lose both their gas bombs and guns, rendering them defenseless and casting doubt on their ability to survive the dangerous setting, which is proven seconds later when Kong traps and kills most of them. Anne screams in terror when the tyrannosaur appears, which drives Kong away from Driscoll who is hiding from him. After the Elasmosaur shows up in Kong's territory and enrages him, he takes Anne outside, where she is then nearly taken away by a Pteranodon. Anne and Jack are able to flee from Kong as he is engaged in combat with a flying reptile. Every moment with these creatures has some type of meaning. It's not just random dinosaur battle number 4 in progress. Also once I gave it some attention, there was a fascinating little detail about these monsters that fundamentally altered my opinion on them. What is that you might be asking? Well see what I mean next time when we discuss these ancient animals and of course Kong himself in the next Road to Gojira video. There's still plenty to talk about here, so I hope you'll all join me next time.